Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Wildcast. My name is Calvin Coyles. I'm joined here by the incredible Dr. Alexandra Stockwell, uh, host of the Intimate Marriage Podcast, expert on all things marriage, intimacy, relationships, and also the author of Uncompromising Intimacy, uh, a, a runaway success in terms of the book. I'm really excited to have a wide-ranging conversation. Uh, selfishly, I'm looking to get a little bit of guidance for myself with my marriage with my beautiful wife, Ash. We've got a newborn, uh, six-month-old little baby, Alila, and that's had a huge impact on our relationship relationship. Some areas have gone to another level, as you can appreciate, and some areas are not quite the same as what they were before. But I know many of you have got children. Some of you listening to this are single as well. We're going to cover on all of that. Uh, Dr. Alexandra, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you and uh, thank you for joining us on the podcast. I'm really excited for this conversation. Yeah. So, Alexandra, let's get started. Tell me a bit of background. Um, you know, the, the space of intimacy, the space of relationships uh, can be quite an intimidating space. And uh, I know from my own experience, when you're in coaching and specifically when you say, hey, I'm a specialist in this area, which you are, then naturally that shines a big light on, well, what gives you the ability to speak on these subjects, right? Like if you're in a gym and someone was a health and fitness expert, you would expect them to, to have obviously the, the six pack abs and the stuff that goes with that as well. So intimacy and marriage, it just it, it becomes a Pandora's box that most people, they say you don't talk about uh, sex, money or religion around the dinner table, right? But this is obviously an important thing that we need to be discussing more. So I'd love to get your take on, uh, number one, what's been your background and what brought you into this world as a relationship and as an intimacy uh, expert and coach and facilitator and teacher in that space? I'd love to get that. And then I'd love to also get some insight and guidance from you on what you think are some of the things that hold couples back from not just starting from a place of intimacy, but obviously continuing to fan those flames in a really, really beautiful way. Okay. Well, I love your question as framed. And let me just start by saying that I used to be an incredibly private person. Yep. If my husband said anything more than this is my wife, I would usually kind of give him a kick under the table. Like I didn't <laughs> want him to say anything that was private. That's behind the closed door of our home. And I didn't talk about it, yep. but I'll get back to the beginnings, but as I really dove deep into relationships and intimacy, mm -hmm. I've really gotten very clear about the fact that we need role models. We need to hear. In fact, we are human beings and human, that's a silly thing to say. What I meant to say is human beings are mammals and mammals yes. learn through imitation, especially when it comes to relationships. And so yeah. we have a plethora of terrible examples and naturally model after them because we learn through imitation. So I'm very glad to talk in great detail about my own marriage. Let's just address that issue right off the bat. I've yep. been married for 26 years and my husband and I have four children. Thank you. Oh, wow. Our oldest is 25. Our youngest is 10. So there's really nothing that I'm talking about that I haven't navigated both personally and professionally and yeah. with the hundreds and hundreds of clients I've coached. Yeah. So in terms of how I got into this, my husband and I, we met the first week of medical school. He still practices medicine. I no longer do. And I usually, when telling this story, talk about how I was about 35 and I had really accomplished all of my goals. I had my own small holistic medical practice north of Boston. I was married to the love of my life. We had three of our children at that time. I had paid off my medical school loans, which in the United States are very it's a huge hefty. Deal. Hey, congratulations. Exactly. Yeah. Especially when you're a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so I thought I'd arrived and I expected to feel differently. Mm. Mm because I had been working for many years to get to this point and it wasn't how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. And I have more to say about that, but I'm going to take a detour and answer how I got into the space in a way that's actually yeah. much more personal and relevant to your situation. Yes, please. Because when we had three children and well, let me first say that my husband and I, as I said, we met the first week of medical school. The early years of our relationship included medical school, they included residency. We had, I had my first child during medical school, my second just before my internship. The point is wow. that it was a good 10 years before we actually had time together without mm -hmm. an exam and without a diaper to change. Yeah. And we loved one another, 
but we didn't have like people sometimes think, oh, I wish the relationship was the way it used to be. I don't feel that way. We loved one another. We were kind, we were supportive, but we didn't have getaway weekends, spending the time in bed or in the hot tub for hours. We never had that because there was never any time. Yeah. And I just assumed once we had more time, the intimacy, the times mm -hmm. that were private would be as gratifying and exciting as the rest of our relationship already was. And that yes. part wasn't. But once we had more time, it turns out it's not just time that you need. Mm. And so we had put some attention into learning to be present and touch yep. one another and be touched in ways that were better. We were, I would say, you know, when the learning curve was starting to curve upward, like it was starting to heat up, there was real hope that we were going to find our way in the bedroom with one another. And then this question arose of whether or not we would have another child. And we went back and forth a long time because I knew that basically this may be different among indigenous peoples, but in regular Western nuclear family based stressed out society, a hundred percent of the time when a baby is born, there is a drop in sexual erotic connection in a couple. And I just really did not want that to happen once we were finally heating yeah. up this yeah, area point, of yeah. our relationship. Exactly. And so and I, just, can I just dive into that a little bit, Alexandra? I mean, sure. I, I can I can give you a whole raft of what I think would be obvious answers for that, but I'm interested to know from your work, uh, both in terms of your work as a clinician and working with co clients around the world, and then obviously as well as your work from a scientific background as well, what are the key drivers that have an impact on that reduction in intimacy within a couple, you know, when when they've when they've just had a child? I mean, there's some obviously easy ones to pick out, but is there anything that our audience listening would go, well, I didn't really think that, that would be the case or that happens at a, at a biological level a lot more than I thought it did. Is there anything that stands out there? Yes, absolutely. So there's there are hormones, there are, you know, physical things, as you say, there are all kinds of things that anyone can think of that are physiological and anatomical. But the one that is of most interest to me because we have the most capacity to do something about it. That's especially true for anyone who's personal growth and coaching oriented is that the reality of birth, both for both parents is incredibly tremendous and life altering. And what happens is each individual's identity mm. is completely shifted. I was going to say turn inside out. I want to use a neutral term because sometimes it is the most incredible, expansive transition. And sometimes yes. it is a lot more complicated because of what gets lost mm. in becoming a parent. But whatever yeah. the case may be, it is a massive, massive identity shift yes. at a time when most people are not putting attention on the identity having shifted if they even have energy or time to because of course the attention goes to getting some sleep having a shower getting the baby changed etc and, et cetera, and et also just to build on that as well you know for most people i mean i know as a as a society we are having children later but certainly for the majority of people that would have children in their 20s or even early 30s um you don't like there's the, 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 these, there's a sense of, I, I'm not who I used to be, but I'm not sure how many people really knew who they were before they had a kid anyway. So it's almost like you're, it can you're transforming and thing. losing what you, what you thought you didn't really know that you were, if, if that sort of makes sense. That's quite an interesting one. Exactly. So that phenomenon is happening. Mm. And what is then the real opportunity? Mm sacred challenge and for Ooh, like so that. many downfall mm. is that let's say a woman becomes a mother or has another child with each one there's an identity shift although with the first one it of course is the most tremendous 
And most women don't really have their attention on it or any idea how to bring the new identity into the marriage. Mm -hmm. And the father, if we're talking heteronormative marital context, but this would apply to anyone becoming a parent, the father also has massive transformation in identity. Sometimes he's not quite aware it's happening in many families. The woman's identity shift gets all the priority and part of his identity shift is not really knowing where he fits in, but Mm. whatever it is, he also doesn't know how to bring his new identity into the marriage. So in addition to the physiological, anatomical consideration, sleep deprivation, et cetera, et cetera, (laughs) I think one of the really, like the area where we have choice is in learning to get to know our new identity and prioritize revealing it to our partner so Mm -hmm. that the marriage stays current with the individuals in it because Um, without that turn on just tanks you know alexandra i just want to compliment you on what you just said there because i thought that was absolutely beautiful the idea of revealing your new identity to your partner you know, I was, as you were talking about the idea of this transformation, I'm, I'm living that now. Um, and you know, everything that you talked about with the mother and the father, you're spot on. And the idea that, you know, I just, when you were saying, you know, you know there's this transformation and almost like getting to know the person that you're now with, I, I was thinking about that concept. And then I sort of, my mind raced a couple of steps ahead to, well, I imagine having a conversation with my wife around, hey, you know, let's allow ourselves to be reintroduced to one another. And the dialogue being, well, I don't really know who I am yet in this new this new role. So I don't know who I can reintroduce myself as because I don't really know who I am now to have that conversation. But the idea of revealing, um, and allowing the exploration of now a new chapter in our life to reveal more of who we are in those moments, that becomes quite exciting because it's less about, hey, you need to be a finished product and you know, figure it out and then come back to me because that could take years to, to get clear on. But the idea of let's explore what this now future looks like together and in doing so, when we meet life, allow that to reveal new aspects of ourselves. Um, you know, I just saw a beautiful expression in my wife that I'd not seen before uh, a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. We were exploring the opportunity of um, of sleep training with our daughter, Alila. She's going through uh, a bit of a, a difficult time on a night. She's teething and that has an impact, right? So we looked at different options and there was an option around self-settling and self-soothing. And, uh, and you know, it really impacted Ash on the idea of letting that happen because that had a whole heap of new meaning for her that she didn't have before. And so it's like, well, I, normally if you don't have kids, you don't appreciate that because you don't know what that's like. But once you had to deal with that, it's like, well, that's a whole new aspect of my wife that I wasn't privy to before when we had children. So I like that idea of, of revealing for one another over time. And that creates a sense of nuance as well, doesn't it? Because so many couples say, well, we've got nothing new to share because nothing new happens in our lives. This can be a real opportunity for that. Yes, and in fact, one of the elements of the new identity, specifically in the postpartum phase, and I don't mean that technically, I mean like in the first year of the baby's life, part of the new identity is a lack of certainty, a Mm. kind of uh, instability that maybe wasn't there before. And so it's not about having things like a job description where it needs to be all clean and clear and this is me. No, it's, well, today I've been wondering if actually I don't like chocolate anymore, but I'm not sure. I'll I'll update you again tomorrow. I mean, that's a silly example, but just to be efficient. uh, And and actually part of this process is you can support Ash in Mm. in understanding, embodying, embracing, and orienting to her new identity by out loud observing this new Uh. expression that you saw, if she's interested to hear it. If she's not, then that wouldn't be helpful and vice versa. In other words, the exploring the new identities can be a profoundly 
collaborative experience, which then is rich for the particular content and for this new, like psychological bushwhacking through new terrain, it that itself creates bonding that can very mm. easily become erotic again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I will just say in terms of my story that when our fourth child was born, I really don't remember exactly how long it was from his birth to when we had what would technically qualify as sexual activity, but there never was a drop in the erotic connection between us, which was the thing that I cared about. I didn't actually care how soon we, you know, I, I don't know how you do this on this podcast, but anyway, I'll just so say you, like, I don't know how- Do whatever you like. <laughs> okay, so I, yeah. I don't know how soon we would have, we had sex, but I know that we never had a drop in the erotic connection. And mm -hmm. maybe that's a thing to also transition to because mm -hmm. for uh, parents with children in particular, I mean, this yeah. is true actually for anyone in a relationship, especially when you're living with that person, but it's especially true when you have children, I've coined the term discrete eroticism because one of the real misnomer misunderstandings about marriage is that sexy time is only in the bedroom after the children are asleep and the dishes are done and you've brushed your teeth mm. and then it happens for a certain, no, that is not enough to really feel nourished in the relationship. Yeah. You can look across the dinner table and cultivate the energy. I'm not talking about being unduly sexual at all, but I really love saying that when it comes to long-term committed relationships, everything which isn't sex is foreplay. It's either bringing you closer together or putting up a little bit of a barrier. Now with a one night stand, not an issue. You don't even have to know your partner's name in order to have a great time. But if you're going to be together yeah. for decades, yeah. then all of the little interactions add up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I love that reference as well of uh, everything, every interaction is either bringing you closer together or moving you further apart. And I think a lot of people, because they don't see the magic in those little moments, then they think that th that time is just neutral time. But if you frame it instead as, hey, it's it's net positive or net negative, then it puts a greater emphasis on all those little moments. Because in the sum of a day or in a week, um, you know, the that that evening of intimacy could have possibly stack against the thousands or millions of interactions that you would have with your partner, even if you both work or you only see each other on an evening anyway, those tiny micro moments, if you add all of those up, even if you didn't have that intimate moment on an evening, that would still add up to a greater experience for most people of connectedness, which for most people is uh, is is more significant anyway, uh, because we we lose that sense of connection. And obviously then, you know, the, the intimacy just you know disappears anyway. Exactly. And I'm picturing many women listening to this and thinking, oh, it's something else to put on my to-do list. It's another thing that I need to worry about. So I just yeah. want to address that. If that is what's in your head as you listen, keep listening because I have something for you. So I love also to give people really actionable, practical tools. I know you like that too. Yes, please, and yeah. So it can often sound like it requires a lot of energy and attention to nurture a relationship 24 mm. seven or during all waking hours. And that does get draining. And that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm really talking about is when you're going to interact, it doesn't take any more time to make that moment together meaningful. So for example, if you're heading out the door to go to work, you can just leave because you and your partner both know that's when you go to work. You can be at the door and say, bye, honey, you know, see you later. You can go find your partner and give a peck on the cheek and head out or a peck on the lips. Or the two of you literally can take, I don't know, three seconds and actually look one another in the eye, mm -hmm. let your lips meet, 
really be with one another and then you head out the door and it really doesn't take more time but it fuels the connection and then when you come home at night whether you're both out or not is not important but when you see one another again it feels like reconnecting Mm. rather than a new day with one another, if you see what I mean. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We, um, we've shared this on the podcast before and I think other episodes, but Ash and I have a little ritual we do in the morning, Alexandra, which we call teammates. Mm. And, um, you know, we've run this business together for a long time up until when we had Leela, we were both in the business. And so every morning we do something very simple, which is we wake up and then we'll ask, how can I be your best teammate today? And it's more of an emotional check in of how we can support one another. And then we say at the end of that, well, then I, I choose you. And so it's reaffirming to us in our marriage that today I choose to be with you again, because, you know, I'm a big believer that you can't, um, you can't sustain a marriage based off the love and intimacy that you shared on your wedding day. That needs to be reaffirmed on a daily basis and you know our rings are a symbol of that but we don't often reaffirm that we don't put on that ring every day and go actually i'm choosing to be married today again you know so those little things for us have made an impact but i love that idea and that reference because certainly i've been guilty of days when i've just left the house and there's days as well where we have that moment of connection beforehand and it makes all the difference yeah and we don't even want to talk about it as guilty. It's more that it's an opportunity yes. that doesn't yeah. take more time. Good refer- and I really love your ritual that you described because even though you didn't use the word desire, it's inherent in there mm-hmm. with both the answer to the question about how to be a good teammate and yeah. in the choosing. It's really beautiful. And I feel like this is actually a good moment to expand on really what is my most significant contribution to the realm of relationships and to the conversation globally. And that is uncompromising intimacy. And the context for that is that really in Western countries anyway, and maybe throughout the whole world, the most common relationship advice that is given is that you need to learn to compromise. If you want a great marriage, you have to be good at compromise. Compromise is the name of the game. And that is just wrong. It is completely wrong. If what you want is a friendly, pleasant, bland companionship, compromise will absolutely deliver that to you. But Mm -hmm. if what you want is a passionate, intimate marriage, dynamic and evolving with a growth orientation compromise will just kill that Mm. Uh, kill that's maybe too dramatic but it will definitely mute that and contribute to the dwindling and tapering off of passion so what i really advocate for is something i call uncompromising intimacy but i need to define uncompromising yeah please it doesn't mean you always get your own way it doesn't mean that you somehow dominate and become a bully where compromise refers to holding back your desires, thoughts, feelings, inner experience, so that your partner is more comfortable with being uncompromising in intimacy. I'm talking about bringing the full truth of who you are, not hiding any aspect to make your partner comfortable, but bringing your desires, bringing your thoughts and feelings and inviting your partner to do the same. And when you both have shared your truth, then you can create all kinds of creative solutions and come up with ways to really honor both. And even if you don't get exactly what you want, It feels completely different to have your partner receive all of you, receive your desire, have the two of you make a different choice that time and then move on. That does not feel like compromise. Uh, uh Uh And when we learn to be uncompromising, I'm not using the word intimacy to mean sexual activity. I mean, any kind of closeness and connection. I mean, emotional intimacy, as well as sensual and erotic intimacy, that with learning how to be uncompromising, how to bring who you really are and speak it with kindness, that is what contributes to passion that just 
increases with the decades and really feeling like wonderful teammates to use your term. Yeah, I love that. Beautiful. Um, Talk to me for someone that is single, that is looking to get into a relationship, normally in the very beginning of a relationship, certainly, you know, finding intimacy and passion is is an abundance, right? Um, And it can be difficult to discern beyond the lust and the, the passion and the excitement and the adrenaline of that and see deeper into the heart of the soul of a person. And I know that you have a process or a program, I believe, that is around identifying and finding your soulmate. Um, and I know that you coach people in that space as well. So I'd love to get some tips for all of our single listeners out there that, um, that are still trying to find that person. Um, what will be your guidance or insight in that space? You know, I was just coaching a client who's a single woman just uh, just before we started recording, Mm -hmm. and it has been incredible to see her shift into Mm -hmm. becoming more honest. It's not that she was ever dishonest, but she shifted from compromise and saying and behaving in ways that she thinks a man is going to prefer to really honoring herself, not in a dominating way. She's actually a very beautiful feminine woman. Mm. Or if if that's not your authentic way, if you're if you're an intense dominating firecracker, well then be that. But the point is be who you really are. Mm. Learn to mm. accept and enjoy who you are mm. and l- speak from there. Mm. That is something that takes practice. In fact, I coached, I I have some single men for clients, but that is my, like, I I coach single women and couples far more. But anyway, I had a man who um, during the pandemic really wasn't interacting with anybody. And Mm. so it made it difficult for me to give him practice assignments to learn and grow because he wasn't interacting. And so I needed to get creative. And I actually said to him, okay, well, when you go to the grocery store, don't use the self-checkout, interact with the person ringing up your groceries. And I said, just pause a moment and look her in the eye and ask her, how she's doing. Now he needed to learn how to give attention to another person because he was fairly self-absorbed and didn't know how to get out of that. And because I told him to do that, I thought to myself, oh, well, I am someone who walks my talk. So I started into interacting with the grocery checkout people differently Mm. when I go shopping. And the point that I'm really making is that Mm. if you're single, That means you have infinite opportunities to learn how to be present, how to honor yourself and honor another person in the same moment to get out of the either or Uh in any interaction you have, which really is the best preparation Uh for being particularly magnetic to Uh a man who wants to be present and hear what you have to say and learn how to share himself more. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that. It's great advice. Um, You know, for everyone listening, we often talk about the idea that in order for you to attract your dream partner, you need to become your own version of that dream partner as well. You know, and I love what you were saying there about being, um, you know, um, uncompromised, let's use your words, uncompromisingly yourself. You know, I think that self-doubt is one of the biggest killers of relationships because it kills relationships before they start. If, if you truly believed in yourself to be your genuine, authentic self and let yourself shine in whatever way that looks like, introverted, extroverted is irrelevant. But if you let yourself just be yourself, you will be that magnetic match to whoever you're meant to be with. But if you downplay who you are, then you're downplaying that. You're going to find somebody that is attracted to that you know, diluted version of you, then when you try to be yourself, you're always going to feel trapped or contained in some way rather than just being yourself. You know, one of the things I'm very grateful for is when my wife and I first met, we made a deal very early on in the very early days of us sort of courting or dating, which was we're not going to play any games. 
you know, I've, I, I never really dated. I was in a long-term relationship before I was with Ash and then I've been with my wife. So I've only had two relationships. I don't have it in me to try and play a game or try to think, who do I need to be to attract this person? And what do they want me to say? I just don't have any time for that. You either like me or you don't like me. You know, I'm more good with that. So that was the sort of paradigm that we went into our relationship with. And um, that's not to say that it would work in every case, but it certainly worked in our case in the sense that we gave ourselves permission just to be ourselves. And we said, if it's going to work, it's going to work by us being us, not us being who we think we need to be, because then you end up playing that game and it cycles you out of your own self and into a version of you that is not in true alignment. And that makes it very difficult to sustain that long-term. If you're trying to be who you want somebody or who you think somebody else wants you to be, that's, um, it's very difficult, very difficult. So, well, for us, and I'm sure you adjust. know, though, that that takes courage Absolutely. and self awareness, emotional Absolutely. intelligence to do that. And once achieved, as I'm sure you would also agree, the key is to continue to be curious. And as you continue to grow and evolve, to continue to be honest and authentic about who you are. I yes. really believe deeply that this is the key to long lasting passion is to continue to grow mm. and to share the growth, to have yes. a relationship which invites the growth, even if it's inconvenient or confronting mm. compared to how the two of you have been together. Absolutely. Previously. Absolutely. Having that rawness and that vulnerability to share those things, I think is profound. And I think if you are being your genuine, authentic self and you're in a growth mindset, and we talked about having that sort of, you know, that, that growth direction, then that's going to happen naturally anyway for you. And if it's not happening, it's not so much a sign, I think, of the, of the marriage or the relationship not working. It's rather you not working your own life. You know, if, if you are playing, a, playing your best version of your own game, then naturally that means that if you and your partner are both doing that, there's so much to share in that. There's real magic in that. Uh, but when when you're not, when you're both not, or when one of you is not, that creates a lot of tension and friction. Um, I'd love to get some insights from you, Alexandra, about what you think maybe are a couple of little things. And I, I, my experience of it is that there might be different for men and women, but I'm interested to know maybe what are overlapping as well. About if, if I'm a husband listening to this, what are some things that today I can go, cool, I'm going to do those little things that might add to a sense of connectedness and our moments of intimacy that can help us bridge that gap of coming back together. And if I'm a, a woman, a wife listening to this or a partner listening to this, that could also be some things as well that I might want to do because it does take two hands to clap. I think if you're listening to this, obviously in your own relationship, you might think, okay, well, there's something I want to improve or change here. Ideally, you're both listening to this. But if you're listening to it, what's some things that the, the, the wife can do? What's some things that the husband can do? What's something that they both can do that can help bridge that gap and bring them close together? Yeah, I'm thrilled to answer this because the answer is actually extremely simple and it applies for men, women. If one of you is listening, if both of you are listening, it's fine if just one of you does this. And if you're single, you can apply this too. And right. that is to cultivate curiosity. When we, if you think back to the experience of falling in love and being in love, we are just filled with questions. Where does that scar come from? What, what was your third grade teacher's name? What countries do you want to travel to? Which ones have you been to? Is spirituality important to you? What's your favorite vegetable? I mean, we are just filled with the curiosity we want to know who this other person is and then as we become comfortable and familiar which is also a really wonderful phase in a relationship to have that ease and comfort with one another and companionship but far too often the curiosity is lost in in it's like titrated down as the comfort titrates up mm -hmm. and it is really wonderful not to have to ask a question because you know how your partner will answer. But if you lose the curiosity, you lose knowing what's new, what continues to evolve. And mm -hmm. when I say cultivate curiosity, I'm not talking about becoming an investigative reporter and getting details. I'm really talking about asking open-ended questions 
meaning there's no right answer. Whatever the answer is just reveals what's alive in your partner mm. and to listen generously. And I want to, so asking questions, that's really for both. And listening generously is for both men and women, but I want to emphasize it for women because we can ask an open-ended question like, um, what is, what's the most challenging aspect of work for you these days? Or what are you listening to when, you, when you're on your commute? You know, are you listening to music or podcasts? And which one? Like any kind of open-ended questions. And let me just say they can be serious. They can be whimsical. They can be sexual fantasies. It really just depends. You know, you can ask um, if you could be president of, of the country, what policies would you change? Or if you could have dinner with a celebrity alive or dead, who would it be? And what would you ask them? Like, I really want to emphasize there's a whole range of open-ended questions yeah. that can open up the energy between the two of you, but it is key to listen generously. And what I mean by that is not judge the answer mm. because as soon as you judge the answer, you're basically unwilling to hear who your partner is becoming. Mm. And you can always be glad the person shared, even if you're not so fond of the content, but if that's your situation, ask mm. questions that you're genuinely interested in hearing the answer to that are not gonna go in that direction. And let me just say, mm. this sounds, so simple. Just ask my partner questions. But I have given lectures where this is one of the things that I taught. I remember mm -hmm. getting a message from a woman who didn't even come to hear me talk. She came to hear the other person who was talking the same night, but then she heard me talk. She'd been married for 32 years. She understood what I said about cultivating curiosity. She went home and asked her husband a question and she let me know that they felt closer than they had in a decade, just mm -hmm. from having a simple conversation to put attention on your partner and ask, and I'll, I'll give another example, a couple who'd really had a tense time. They weren't really talking to one another that much because they had such a conflict because he had bought a motorcycle and she didn't want him to have one. <laughs> And so she's like, how can this work for me? And so I suggested to her that she arrange a time to talk with him. And it was actually very important that she said, you know, just, just to listen. And then he was willing. And so she said to him, what do you, what do you love about having a motorcycle? a question she had never asked despite a lot of conflict about it. She, she said, what do you love about it? And she had tears in her eyes when she spoke with me a week later and said, uh, his answer made so much sense to me. And this yeah. one 15 minute conversation where she just asked him this and he got to share and she saw, oh yeah, like that's who he is. He loves the freedom and whatever the details were. And this one open-ended question and the conversation that followed, they went from a few months of, months of tension to a friendliness and thaw and affection. Just from that, it didn't mean that she was a fan of the motorcycle. It didn't mean that she had to compromise on her priorities. It just meant that she knew what was living in him and mm -hmm. with the curiosity, comes connection and mm. creative solutions that are just completely unavailable without the curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's amazing how in that knowing and familiarity of somebody, we, we forget to ask the simple, obvious questions that a stranger would ask. Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. And uh, there, there's a lot in that. Uh, there's a lot in that. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's that, that's magic. I laugh because my granddad and my gran, uh, granddad is is a bike enthusiast. He loves buying motorbikes, and that's <laughs> a constant argument for for them about him buying and selling motorbikes. And I I don't think I'm not sure if Grant ever asked the question of why he loves motorbikes, but I'm inspired to ask it maybe over dinner, and I can give her that insight herself. Uh, that's that's incredible. That's excellent. I love that. Um, <laughs> so. If, uh, if someone's out there in terms of a next step uh, to connect with you th- further, to get to know you more, obviously we'll put the show notes up as well. Um, I've, uh, I've heard excellent things. I, I Forgive me for not have, having read the book before we got on the call, but I'm inspired to read it with Ash uh, now that we've we finished the call, being uh, uncompromising intimacy. Um, tell me, what's the key things that someone's going to get from that book um, that would inspire them to want to pick it up? And we'll put a link to, uh, to the site where they can purchase that in, in the show notes. Okay. Fabulous. And actually at that link, you can also just download the first chapter for free if you want to check it out. Great. Thank you for that. That's beautiful. And and also buy it and it's on Audible. So the beginning of the book, I talk about the four kinds of relationships. Okay. There's toxic, termination, tolerance, and then what I call the conscious partnership. And so Uh it's helpful to just identify where you are. And then the rest of the book is stories from my marriage and from clients that I've coached who have used the six tools that I teach in the book to completely transform their relationship. So if you have a great relationship, read the book to become more conscious and really solidify. Mm -hmm. So you have tools that will last you the rest of your life for when things are more challenging. And if you're feeling disconnected, unseen, unheard in any way, dissatisfied in your relationship, then this book will give you the tools to really change that. It's very practical and also digestible because of all of the stories. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I appreciate it deeply. Um, one final bit of wisdom. If, you, if, you had, uh, if you're in an elevator with a couple that's having an argument and you could give them one piece of advice, uh, one takeaway message for everyone that's at home, what would be that one message? So what I would say is this, is this is a couple in the elevator who are just there or they're arguing. I, I forgot the setup. They're there. They're arguing. She okay. says or he says, I can't do this anymore. Okay. So and it's like, that's the moment they're either going to get out of the elevator healed, right? By the healing hands of, of Alexandra, or they're going to get off the elevator and uh, they're going to go for different floors and, uh, and the marriage is over. What, what's the, what's the one thing? The one thing is both of you need to take a breath and pay attention to how you feel and then share that because very often when a couple is in conflict the attention is on the other person and how irritating annoying aggressive or whatever they are and when you bring your attention back into your own body and your own soul and you notice you feel afraid you feel hopeless you feel inadequate, whatever it is, if you both notice how you feel without any blame, it can just be a single adjective and share that. Suddenly the energy changes because there's truth in the room. Mm. It's, it's an, an mm. inadvertent example of uncompromising intimacy in the way that mm. I use the term. And then the conversation can go in a new direction. Because as you said earlier, it's so beautiful how you described it. It's essential that we know ourselves in order to be available for relationship. Beautiful words. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Alexander uh, Stockwell, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I've really thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and the um, the link we'll put obviously in the show notes for everybody to be able to get access to this. Uh, I you know again I have so many wonderful things to say about. It. I'm going to share this conversation with my wife today uh, when we get 
back home. And, um, and I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for being of service. Uh, for everyone that's watching or listening, uh, wherever you happen to find this podcast, please leave us, leave us a like, a comment, a review of some form. And obviously, if you want to find out more about Alexander's work, um, by all means, check out the links in the show notes as well. And, um, and we look forward to seeing you on the journey. And until we see you live or online, be bold, have fun, go make an impact in the world, and we'll see you on the wild side. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Thank you so much, Steve.